Hi there, everybody, and welcome to this alternative presentation that was supposed to run as a live demo on the uh, EAN conference in 2022 in Vienna. So because of some airline troubles, this could not be done live, unfortunately. So I thought I'd bring this to you via a different medium. My name is Nens van Alphen. I'm a neurologist, an associate professor of neurology at the Radboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. And today I was very excited to be able to talk about two topics that involve ultrasound of muscle used for imaging movements. So the first part of this two-part series is going to be about fasciculations, um, which is, I think, something that several people have been doing over the past couple of years. Uh, it's not at the forefront, but it's, I think, a very good summary of where we are now and what they look like. And then in the second part, we will go and talk about tremor, and that is completely new. So I hope to see you for both. So let's start with this presentation on the use of neuromuscular ultrasound for the detection of fasciculations. So how do you capture movement with an ultrasound, right? Well, here's a short scan demo of how we approach muscle ultrasound in the first place. You find a standardized location, usually at the site of the maximum bulk. You put a little pen stripe on the muscle and the skin there, and you capture an image three times. And then you look for the optimally bright image, meaning that the reflections of the bone and the um, intramuscular fascia are as bright as they can be. And you do that by angling the transducer until the screen is optimally bright. Now, obviously, most ultrasound machines also have video capture. So you can sort of select a preset that will allow you to capture it forward and look for any abnormal muscle movements that might be there. And basically, you just see more when things move, right? So this is a um, an Im still image of a forest near my parents-in-law. And I can assure you, there is a mouse very busy preparing for winter in this video. But I think unless I start the video, it's pretty hard to see it, right? And as soon as I start this video, I think you can see the mouse. And I decided not to disturb it more. But this is a lovely example of how well we can picture things when they are actually moving and updated. So <clears throat> if you want to capture muscle movements with ultrasound, it sort of um, elicits the question up front of what you want to see. So there is a slight difference in the technical setup there. And if it is, for example, fibrillations, which is the video is already running here on the left of the screen, then you need different settings for your ultrasound equipment than if you want to see this, which is fasciculations, or this, which is whole muscle contraction during swallowing. So they become the image and the size of the image that's moving becomes progressively larger. And that means you need to tweak your settings. Now, there are several things that move in muscle ultrasound, right? So here is a table. Um, that we've sort of compiled for a study on automated movement detection, where you can see that there's several phenomena that you might want to pick up. One is fasciculations, uh, contraction pseudotremor, which is a very complicated term and not a very usual term, but it, it's intended to mean large motor units that you can actually see contracting under the skin because they have so large uh, bicollateral re -innovation. Vascular pulsations will be visible, obviously, you can see probe motion, so someone is not holding the probe optimally still. You can try and see fibrillations, tiny movements of individual muscle fibers, and you can see voluntary contraction, obviously. Now, and they have different characteristics that we've outlined in this table. So the duration will differ from for six to uh, movement and the regularity, for example. If it's a signal in the screen that moves with 60 beats per minute, always at the same spot and it's a round structure. I think you already guessed that it's probably a blood vessel, right? So these characteristics can be used to define whatever you see is moving. Now, here we're gonna look at fibrillations first. 
And these are very tiny movements. This is actually on the left is masseter muscle. It's on the mandible, so the bone is here. Everything beneath this is a false echo. It's a reverberation artifact, but you need to look in that area on top. And you see these tiny trembling movements while the subcutaneous layer is still. Now, these are re really small. Uh, and usually you need a linear transducer with at least five to 15 megahertz ca um, capture rate and a maximum frequency setting for the depth that you're scanning. So the minimum would be 20 hertz, 20 frames or images per second, but optimal would be 60 to 80 hertz to capture all these tiny movements. And you also need to turn any image optimizers, such as smoothing software, off if you can. Otherwise, these tiny movements will be smoothed away. Now, usually we set the video capture to 30 seconds forward, but obviously you could also choose 10 or, or a minute, whatever you prefer. And something that is not maybe very well known, but it's very important to warm the patient to 37 degrees of body temperature because fibrillations will disappear when you are at 32 degrees centigrade. You will miss at least 30% of these fibs if you cool down to the regular temperature that we perform electrodiagnostic studies at. So here was a, a first <clears throat> publication on the topic and a editorial there. And so you see the subcutus fascia and rectus femoris in a patient with acute onset myositis. And I realized that at first you think this technician or the scanning person had a tremor, but you can see that the skin subcutaneous layer again is still and just the muscle below is fibrillating. And you can't see this, but again, it needs some work up front. If you didn't believe me right now, so we've done a different study where we denervated um, extensor digitorum brevis muscles because of an experiment with end plate zones and, and we used botulinum toxin. But then as a side test, we also inserted an EMG needle that you can see there in the ultrasound zoomed in image and recorded simultaneously the ultrasound and the EMG needle signal. And these are just bits. I think if you've heard them before, you recognize them. So that's what they are. Here's some more examples of it. So this is actually the deep finger flexors on the ulnar side of the ventral forearm. That big thing here is the ulna. And this is FCU, flexor carpi ulnaris. And here, this zone is the deep flexors. And you can also see these movements here. It's a similar case of a acute onset myositis. Now, there need to be at least five of these fibs per second. Otherwise, they are just too small to be able to cause movement enough for the, um, the resolution that your ultrasound transducer has at these frequencies of 5 to 15 megahertz. Here's another example of the gastroc. This is a little less conspicuous, so I've outlined it in a circle or an oval for you. It's just there are these wriggling sites here, right? So this, just like these muscle fibers are sort of trying to get out or they're boxing each other. Or, and that's, that's the movement that's associated with fibs. So let's, let's go a little bit bigger and look at fasciculations here, right? So they are the, the main characteristic of a fasciculation is that it's random, it's irregular, it can't be predicted. Um, and they are whole motor units, so their territory might be up to, I don't know, 1.5 centimeters. Um, so much larger than the fibrillation with the single fibers. <clears throat> and they also need uh, a bit of a technical setup beforehand. But it won't differ much from what you just did. If you can see fibs, you can certainly see fasciculations. Uh, the frame rate could be a little bit less, but at least five hertz, five frames per second, which is very low. I think most, most systems will go to like 15, 20, 25, whatever. Uh, also here, you need to turn the smoothing software off and you want a video capture and at least 32 degrees centigrade, but body temperature would be best. Now, here's for six, and they are a little bit tricky because they are random and you don't know where they will appear. So you're sort of scanning the whole image here to see where they are. And, and then you see the sudden movement and your eyes go to that spot. And then there's another movement at another spot. So if you want to capture these for 30 seconds, please uh, make sure that you save them as a video so you can sort of review it 
offline and, and find more because it's really hard to do this in one go and see everything that's going on when it's so randomly distributed in the screen. Now, here are some more and you are sort of waiting for it to happen. Is there going to be a movement somewhere locally? Well, there is. But in this case, it's rare. And I think we already missed it. So did you see it? It was down there in the peroneus longus muscle. Really difficult to spot like this. So you have to be very careful when you watch these videos. Okay. This is an instance of also large motor units, but not for six, they are not random. So this is someone with a denervated calf following S1 radiculopathy from a lumbar herniation or sacral herniation. And you can see when the foot is flexed that the muscle is activated and you see these large motor units actually contracting below the skin. So they can be turned on and off by uh, putting force on the muscle, but they are not for six. This is just, contraction, right? Here's another example when we used ultrasound there. So this is just one giant motor unit territory that's continuously contracting in a biceps brachii and someone who had a denervated biceps from a disorder called neuralgic amyotrophy or brachial plexopathy. And I'll show this to you again to show you that it's completely, oh, sorry, non-random. So um, I think clinically, you need to be aware of those in anti-gravity muscles. If you're doing a clinical exam and you think something is a fasciculation, but you can get the muscle to completely relax. Uh, so not standing up here or maybe uh, trying a different position, then these will go away. If you get the muscle to maximally contract, then they will also go away because the contraction will fuse the muscle fiber uh, force, so to speak. Um, so here's that ultrasound that I wanted to point out again, that it's just the same territory all the time. And that is not a fasciculation ever. Okay. So here's another one in the first dorsal interosseous muscle. You see the two bony shadows of the little bones of the hand. And there's this just one motor unit. This patient is not relaxing sufficiently. So it's a large motor unit at a low recruitment rate. And now look at something larger, right? So this is voluntary contraction. Um, it will be the whole muscle outline moving in this or the muscle belly that you're looking at. So this is the, um, an ultrasound scan of the floor of the mouth. So the probe is actually like my hand right now, looking up, uh, which is down in this image. And you see the digastric muscles on the side, like the ears, and then you see this comma shaped, and that's the geniohyoid and someone is swallowing here. So you can do this with a linear on Kavex probe uh, because it's such a large movement. You can, you know, you don't need a very high frame rate or frequency here. It's good to have those image optimizers off again and you can capture whatever time you need for the contraction. And here you see another uh, few examples of whole muscle contraction. So on the left, this is the uh, anterior compartment in the lower leg with tibialis anterior, with that slanted or oblique central fascia. And then the thing moving on the left is the uh, extensor hallucis, which is in the deep regions. On the right, you see a somewhat older video of biceps brachii contracting. And then you see the line between the two heads and they're actually sliding across each other if you contract. So the medial head is sliding on top of the lateral head. So these are whole muscle contractions. Mind you, the patient doesn't have to contract, actually. You can also move the joint that's attached to this muscle. So, for example, a toe or the elbow uh, on the right. This is a very confident way, by the way, to finding a muscle part that moves something. So you can stick, for example, an EMG needle in with uh, confidence that you are at the right spot. Okay, so this is just a quiz question for you, right? I think you will know. So we'll start the video. What's this? And here we have the corresponding EMG image. Okay. 
And if you've just seen uh, the previous video segment, I think you will, won't have any problem identifying the uh, contraction pseudo tremor in this video. So a large motor unit that's so big, you can see it contracting through the skin. And then this one, what you see here, this is biceps brachii. And it's, um, you know, the, the, the image as a whole is not completely still, but the muscle is continuously moving. And there's some larger chunks, but there are also smaller elements that move here. The muscle is also white. It's much whiter than you would normally expect it to be. So this uh, went from biceps to deltoid, but I'll show the biceps again. So actually you see a couple things here. These are both fibrillations, the tiny trembling movement that's just in the muscle. There are fasciculations, so irregular random jumps of muscle tissue contracting. And there's also maybe some irregularity. But it's not always easy on the fly, as this video will show you. So this is a very, uh, I was, ah, here it goes, right? So here's the video. And just try and figure out for yourself, how many movements do you really see in this video? And how many of these movements were fasciculations, if you've seen the whole picture? And are you seeing the pulsation artifact here? So, and this is a 30 second segment, but you can imagine that if you have like a one minute or two minute fragment, that it becomes a strain on your brain, right? To remember everything that's going on in this video. So, sorry, there's no prize for the actual number of movements here, but just to show you the concept that uh, it's difficult for us to manage this at just one look or one glance. So here is where artificial intelligence or machine learning can help you. So um, some time ago, we devised a speckle tracking algorithm that just follows parts of the ultrasound screen and records where they move over time. And then you can implement in a uh, Python or JavaScript or whatever, you can implement these different characteristics such as the duration, how many frames did this movement last, the area, how many pixels were involved in moving together, uh, whether they occur together or not, where are the periodic and how much the whole screen was moving. Uh, this has been published. And if you do that, you can create something like this. So here, the algorithm detects the overall level of movement, which are the tiny, you know, wavelets on the bottom end. And sometimes there are spikes, and those are big movements somewhere locally in the screen, and it flashes them in a color. And so this algorithm with a visual representation on the right will show you where certain movements occur. And you can see a pulsation artifact in the top um, sorry, bottom left, but you can also see the for six. Now, this can help you uh, by pre-selecting regions of interest. So these are this is a 500 frame video that you have to you know to physically assess, but it helps you if the computer just flags the frames where some image movement is going on, and that saves you time. So it's observer independent. Um, if you put in the right characteristics, the algorithm can detect fasciculations from other movements, the computer will be very sensitive to the movement and the human will provide specificity. And the results of the study we did where we pre-screened and viewed all these images with a human observer to say what the movement was and then the computer had detected them all, um, made us just having to consider 5% of these frames at the end, which will, if you implement this in your practice, will save you a lot of time. So we're working on that right now. So let's look up some practice examples of how you could use for circulation screening. For example, for ultrasound of denovation in ALS. So uh, currently the gold coast criteria are operational, they are new, and they are a little less strict than the previous criteria, but they will ask you that there are abnormalities of uh, that um, point to chronic neurogenic changes and ongoing denovation. And if you read the footnotes, uh, here it says EMG, but you can also use other techniques such as ultrasound or maybe even MRI to do that. But you do need to find evidence of both. So um, 
what we do with ultrasound is that we screen the muscle as a whole. And if it starts to look white, that is evidence that some denervation has happened without insuff uh, with insufficient re -innovation. So the gray value of the image is assessed. And then for the ongoing process, um, you look at fibrillations and fasciculations, right? Now, if you use fasciculation screening with ultrasound and ALS, you actually detect a lot more fascics than just by eyeballing the limb or the body region or by using a needle EMG, just because there's a much larger pickup area compared to the, the tip of the needle. And you uh, increase your identification to almost the perfect assessment. If you have a patient at the time of diagnosis suspected for ALS, and you do this fasciculation screening, then about half of the muscles that you assess will present with fasciculations. It's maybe less than you thought, but this is at the time of diagnosis, not a progressive case. But if you do see fasciculations and find them in more than two out of nine muscles scanned, then you have a very high chance of having ALS. But they do have a temporal detection window in this disorder. So um, like I just said, a diagnosis, only half the muscles fasciculates. A bit later, this will increase to about 100%, especially in the cervical region, in, in the classic phenotype. But then in the end stages, the muscles are so denervated that they can't fasciculate anymore and you won't find it. So the optimal scan time seems to be 30 seconds. Some people advocate a minute. Um, it sort of also depends on the time you can spend in your practice. Now, um, this is just another example of this denervation with physics. And you can sort of, if you can put an ultrasound probe on, this is again biceps brachii, you can find them. I don't think you need any very difficult training to use muscle ultrasound this way. Here's one last example of acute and chronic denervation of fibrillations and fasciculations in the flexor compartment of the forearm. So you can see the tiny trembly wriggly movements and you can see the larger chunks of muscle that move. And there is some uh, pulsation artifacts as well in the fascial arteries. Now, again, you don't need any fancy reference values for it, not a fancy ultrasound machine, just something that will give you that basic presets and you can scan for these with confidence. Um, here are some technical details about for six. So uh, related to that pickup area and the sensitivity of the technique that you choose. So a motor unit is usually five to 15 square millimeters. The pickup area of ultrasound is like the four by four centimeter screen that you just seen. Well, the pickup area of a concentric needle electrode is only 0 0.7 square millimeters. And if you um, have an identical scan time, for example, the 30 second uh, window, then this studies have found that you can see 89% of the fasciculations with ultrasound and 52 with needle EMG. So there, there's a big difference in the two. And only maybe the really small ones are difficult to detect. Um, so there are some uh, other details, but basically it's just, it just comes down to the size and pickup area of the technique that you use. Now here again are some small fasciculations in the temporalis muscle. So you can see the scan head is just above the zygoma and you see the dent in the skull forming the base layer here. And there are really tiny twitchy movements in that deep layer there. Okay, that's it for the fasciculation part. Thank you very much. Uh, and I just wanted to leave you with a smile. And I really love these cartoons by the awkward Yeti. So I want to give this guy some credit. Thank you very much. <laughs>